Live from Las Vegas, Nevada, it's The Q at HP Discover 2014. Brought to you by HP. Good morning from Las Vegas, everybody. This is theCUBE, and my name is Dave Vellante, and I'm here with Jeff Frick. This is day two of HP Discover. We actually came in early. We were meeting with some customers of HP's on Monday night, unpacking some of their secrets. Day two yesterday was uh, a big day. Uh, we had David Scott on, uh, talked went in depth in storage, had a, <clears throat> excuse me, a bunch of customers on. Today is really around a combination of, we're going to be interviewing customers. Uh, we're going to be hearing from Bill Vecti, who leads the enterprise group. Bill Vecti took over for Dave Donatelli, uh, who came from EMC and has now left HP. So Vecti is now the man in charge of the enterprise group, which, which comprises servers, storage, networking, and technology services. So we're going to hear from him. Uh, Bill Vecti was the COO of HP and helped architect H HP's cloud strategy. So he's a super senior executive, <clears throat> one of Meg's right-hand men, and somebody that we're very excited to have on theCUBE. As well, we're going to hear from a lot of the server folks today. <clears throat> so, you're going to hear from people uh, around uh, what HP announced on uh, something called Apollo, which is a big supercomputer, high performance computing capability, uh, and others from the, uh, uh, the ISS group, the x86 business. So, we're going to be unpacking a lot of that today. Uh, we've also got uh, some fun this afternoon uh, what time do the puppets come up? <laughs> uh, 12.20, we'll be joined by Mario and uh, Fatah, the, uh, the groundhog, um, from, uh, from Glove and Boots. If, if you've been paying any attention to the show at all, you can't have missed them. They, they did a funny, like a six minute commercial. They were at the party last night. They actually stopped by the, the cube yesterday to get the lay of the land. We, we posted a couple pictures up on, um, up on, on the Twitter feed. So, they're coming in, and also we're getting more customers, Dave, which is kind of a nice trend here at, at, at HP. A lot of times, we, you know, well, as a, ma as a matter of fact, we never get enough customers. We always want more customers. And so we've got a bunch coming in. Looks like we have the healthcare industry represented pretty well. Um, and in big cloud day today. Big cloud. Uh, so Kerry Bailey is coming on. He's the new senior vice president in the go-to-market side of things. Uh, Sar Gilai is coming on. Sar is the COO of HP's cloud, and essentially, really architected HP's cloud strategy under the direction of Bill Vecti. Vecti. Uh, and so, HP announced uh, Heli Helion, I always say that wrong, it's Helion. It Helion, Hel like helium? Helion. Okay. They announced Helion a few weeks ago, and um, it is really their, it's kind of their, I would say, second or third generation of cloud. They announced the HP public cloud a while back, which was, you know, frankly, largely vapor. Um, and But they've now started to bake it out, uh, and so, it's really about the hybrid, and that's what we're going to hear from those guys today. So big cloud day. Uh, John Furrier flew back to San Francisco for, for another event that we're doing there. Uh, so you'll see some of that action going on around Flash. Uh, and that was the big theme yesterday. I want to come back and talk about that. And then John will be back. I'm sure he's excited about the, the, the cloud action. And so, um, and we're also going to hear from uh, the Moonshot guys. So Moonshot was a product that was announced a couple years ago. Uh, the new, new type of server. Uh, very efficient, highly dense, using cartridges to essentially change the personality of the server. Uh, it's something that HP.com is run on. HP.com gets a lot of hits. We want to get an update on that, you know, see where it's at. Uh, haven't heard much from the Moonshot guys lately, uh, and they are going to be on the Cube to give us an update there. So, uh, Jeff, you, um, so last night, yeah, we were at the, the storage uh, party. Dave Scott, David Scott, it was uh, sponsored by Emulex, Brocade, and QLogic. It's always a big, big bash, it's at Excess, it was at the Encore. We stopped by, we kind of did, did an early evening because we were prepping for theCUBE today. Day. But the big thing, the big news yesterday was HP announced an all flash array last summer, and at the time, we said okay, looks good, it's got a full stack. Now, for, for those of you who don't follow this market closely, it takes a long time to build up a full storage stack. Specifically, we're talking about things like snapshots, thin provisioning, resiliency, data migration, all the storage services that guys like EMC have built up and, and, and perfected in NetApp over the years. I mean, decades to build this stuff out, really robust, mission critical, you know, high-end capabilities, mainframe-like capabilities for 
you, you know, mid-range cost. So 3PAR had that, and 3PAR said, okay, we don't need to go out and buy a new company to compete in the all-flash array, like IBM did with Texas Memory Systems, like EMC did with Extreme IO, et cetera. We have an architecture that we can adapt for flash. When they announced last summer, a lot of us in the analyst community felt it was good strategy, but too expensive. <clears throat> they had more expensive flash. Uh, they didn't have data deduplication, <clears throat> like the guys, for instance, from, from Pure, that are really pushing data dedupe and, and compression. Um, and it just felt like it was early and expensive. It was about $13 a gigabyte. Well, they announced yesterday that they are using lower cost flash, and they are applying data deduplication in line to the product and they got prices down now below $2 per gigabyte, which is comparable to high speed spinning disks. So this is the day we've been waiting for, the day that flash replaces high end spinning disk and eventually you know, it'll eat into the, to the core of the disk market, that will take some time. Like our laptops, I don't know about you, but I don't use spinning disk same, in my laptop. Same, same. You don't have spinning disk in your laptop. Only thing we use spinning disk for is I carry one around in my bag Right, to back up every now and then. Right. right? It's my archive. Right. So that's, the, that's what's happening at, in the enterprise. Right. The spinning disk is becoming the bit bucket. Yeah, you know, and I'm always, you know, we like sports, we talk a little about sports, and I always think of there's a great uh, analogy with <coughs> NFL films back in the day when, you know, shooting in, shooting in slow motion was a lot more expensive than shooting in regular film. And they ask, they ask NFL films, well, how did you get that play in in slow motion, how did you know to, to, that was the one of the hundred that you shoot in slow motion? And he said, you know, we just shoot everything in slow motion because we don't know when that play is going to be. And I, I just get this feeling with all the vibe around Flash that the adoption of Flash, the benefits of, of Flash optimized applications is going to push that a lot quicker than I think most people are giving credit to. And then, you know, a lot of talk here at the show about this magic price point, the $2 uh, per gig price point, which sounds like we've achieved and is, and is a critical tipping point. You've covered the, the space forever. Is that a big tipping point? Here's what's happening. I, th I think it is a tipping point. And it, the, the tipping point is not so much the, the cost. I mean, it is. It happens to be that in June of 2014, that happens to be the price. The tipping point really is that flash pricing is now getting close enough to the comparable high end of the spinning disc market. And that is the tipping point. Now, I got I to gotta give props to David Floyer. I've been working with David Floyer for a number of years and he's made a lot of good calls over the years. One that he made back in 2009, he did a flash, you can go on the wiki and check it out, flash uh, a cost uh, and, and pricing forecast. And in that he said, well, there's a lot of innovation coming in flash and prices are going to be coming down between 50 and 70% per year. So he ran a model and he said, here's what's going to happen if it goes, if the pricing comes down on a compound basis, 50% a year, here's 60% a year, here's 70% a year. So he used 60% as sort of the mid case, because that's what he thought that it was going to come down at. And that's essentially what it was tracking at up until recently. And in 2009, Floyer projected that by 2014, flash would be close enough to, to high end spinning disk. By high end spinning disk, we mean high spin speed fiber channel and SAS disk spinning at 15,000 RPM, so called high performance disk that by 2014 the prices would be close enough that essentially it would be the tipping point. So that really is the factor. And, and I'm, I'm just so impressed because Floyd was, he was right on. I mean, it's June of 2014, we're right in the middle of the year and it's exactly what he predicted. So, so kudos to him. Now what's happening is prices have been coming down for a number of reasons. One is use, the use of lower cost flash. The second is the higher capacity flash devices. And the third is the use of technologies like compression and data deduplication, which you can use on flash. It was harder to use on spinning disk because it would slow the spinning disk down even further. And that's the last thing you want to do with spinning disk. So for instance, NetApp popularized things like data deduplication and um, compression within their arrays. They would give it away for free, but many customers didn't turn it on because it hurt performance. Right. The only company that has a compression that really doesn't fundamentally hurt performance of spinning disk is IBM with IBM real-time compression, and they're finally getting that to market. Uh, now, the point is, you can, you can use compression and dedupe in flash because it's so fast if you implement it correctly, and that's what's happening in the marketplace. So, 
All the innovation in flash is causing flash prices to come down faster than disk prices, and that is really causing the tipping point. Well, the other big thing, Dave, and everything you just went through is all about cost, 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 and delivering on the same applications with different infrastructure to drive down costs. But what you didn't talk as much about, and we talked a lot at actually Hadoop Summit uh, last week, is really the value that these new applications are unleashing with the Internet of Things and big data. That now, you know, marginal increases in the performance of these applications, or slight variations in the performance of these applications, or in enabling the speed of business to move faster with um, big data and these flash uh, enabled applications so people are making decisions in real time. The business impact at scale is huge. So you know we talk about cost, cost based pricing and value based pricing and it really feels to me that this flash on this uh, complete uh, st perfect storm of, of big data and cloud and infrastructure and like I said Moore's Law applying across the entire stack is now making that flash investment look a lot different from an ROI point of view as opposed to simply trying to replace existing infrastructure. Well, let, me, let me comment on that because you are right on. That really is the exciting part about flash. It's not all, the, it's the cost, it's the value. Now, having said that, it's all about economics, but the reason why we're so excited about flash is because spinning disk, I liken spinning disk to a military convoy. I've used this analogy many times where the slowest vehicle in the, con or all the convoy has to slow up, all the vehicles in the convoy have to slow down to, to allow the slowest vehicle to keep up. That's what disk drives are like. The spinning mechanical disk is the bottleneck in computer systems. So flash eliminates that, but not only. So what you're seeing, and you're seeing advancements from guys like Fusion IO who have uh, a, a strong relationship with HP. Uh, they're tightening that relationship. Fusion IO now is run by a bunch of XHP guys, you know, right. particularly right. Shane Robinson. And they Shane just had their big announcement right. uh, the other night. That yeah, we you guys were there. That's right. Yeah, so the, the Atomic Series launch, which really, if you read, again, Floyer's research piece, on the benefits of atomic rights, writing once and not twice, on the benefits of the NVM compression, um, on all the benefits that are basically enabled in this software, sitting on top of the really um, commodity flash component, uh, and, and that's really what they announced in this atomic series. So let's unpack that a little bit. So Flash 1.0 was stuffing flash drives into essentially a VMAX, EMC announced it, uh, and and it dealt with some of the performance problems that they had, but it very quickly ran out of gas because the controller bandwidth wasn't designed to accommodate flash. So then you saw companies come out with, actually at the same time you saw Fusion IO come out and say, let's put the flash right into a PCIe card, right. closer to the server. So you had them at both ends of the spectrum, at the end of the, 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 the wire with the, the disk subsystem, and as close to the server as possible. And the flash has been filling in that entire spectrum with with, with hybrid arrays, like, like guys from Nimble, who we're covering today at, at their event, um, to all flash arrays, uh, companies like Pure and Violin, and now Extreme IO, and, and HP, and many, many others, everybody's working on this stuff. What you're seeing is, not only is flash eliminating the spinning disk mechanical movement, but with technologies like Atomic Rights, which Fusion IO uh, is really one of the few vendors, if not the only vendor, shipping today, EMC made the acquisition of DSSD, and that's, I think, what this is all about. But atomic writes essentially directly write to flash as an extension of memory. So think of it as an expanded memory with a direct memory access protocol, essentially, with primitives that allow you to write directly to the memory. What that does is it eliminates the SCSI protocol overhead. So SCSI is the disk protocol, which has been hardened over the years. It's very chatty. It's, it's not conducive to performance, but that was okay because when you spin the disk, it's so slow anyway, so you add a little bit of overhead, no big deal. Well, when you eliminate that spinning disk, that SCSI protocol becomes the vast majority of the bottleneck. So atomic rights essentially eliminate that. So you're going to see the, a full flash spectrum emerge. It is emerging, and it's very exciting for the following reasons that you brought up earlier. It changes the way applications are going to be designed. An application programmer realizes that when he or she has to go to disk and do a write, it's going to be slow. So they have to go off and do other things in parallel. If you have a virtually unlimited resource that's persistent in memory, you can now change things. You can do writes directly to that memory and change the way in which you design applications and, and, and achieve not an order of magnitude, but potentially two orders of magnitude performance. That's exciting, that's going to support mobile, 
That's going to support you know, pushing data to the edge. That's going to support you know, video applications and all the new emerging applications that we're seeing out there. So right. that's why we're so excited yeah, about it. Yeah, and, and applications built specifically to take advantage of this capability. So it, it begs the question, then what's the next point of failure, right? Every, uh, as you mentioned, every, every process, you, you're always gated by your slowest piece of the chain. Well, I think it's what a network now. The next one? I think it's, it's a, a network, network. yeah. So, so that's why everybody's, so networks are very hierarchical. I said yesterday on theCUBE, the net networks in, in the enterprise are like the Kremlin, very hierarchical and structured, and, and what's happening is those networks are flattening. Traffic, you know, used to be the emphasis was on north-south traffic, and now it's about east-west, getting stuff out to the edge, wireless networks at the edge, supporting mobile applications, so I think that's where you're going to see some of the bottleneck emerge, and so that's why people are so focused on things like software-defined, improving flexibility, and obviously higher performance. Two other guests that I want to mention today that are coming up. Robert Youngjohns uh, is right. taking over, has taken over for uh, George Kadifa, uh, uh, whom you know quite well, you know, the Palo Alto guy, uh, and, and is now running the software business. He is the senior vice president and general manager of HP uh, Software. Um, in he, fact, he hit his keynote yesterday with a ton of steam. Of all the keynotes that we saw yesterday, he was really charged up uh, and really came out guns blazing. And then Antonio Neri, who runs the server and communication and, and networking business. So Antonio used to run the services business and now runs the networking and server business. So we're going to hear from him. We got to leave it there. We'll be back with our next guest right after this. This is theCUBE. We're live from HP Discover. This is day two. Dave Vellante and Jeff Frick. We'll be right back. <laughs>